lasting peace, built on justice and understanding among nations. This is the objective of the United Nations. This is another program in the United Nations series of the Pacific Story. One of the five special series presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations to further world unity and world peace through understanding. For hundreds of years, the Pacific and the lands it touches have been the scene of struggle, conflict for gain and power, people against people, and the millions caught in the political and economic cross current. Today, with most of the world's population concentrated around and in the Pacific, the events of the Pacific are a vital world concern. The Pacific Story dedicates this series to the objective of the United Nations, lasting peace, built on justice and understanding among nations. in the East. We think of the Far East as man's preserve. Here, for thousands of years, woman has been the chattel of her lord and master. But today, something is happening in that vast region which promises to fix for succeeding generations the shape of things to come. Today, a new voice is heard in China, in India, the Philippines, even in tradition-ridden Japan. A woman's suffrage in Japan is not a gift handed to us on a silver tray. It was won by the efforts of the Japanese women. This is Shizui Kato, the former Baroness Ishimoto, speaking at a political mass meeting for women at Hibiya Auditorium in Tokyo, the first ever held in Japan. I am a candidate for the diet as a socialist. Behind me on the platform here sits one of my political rivals, Mrs. O. Kimi Kubishiro, a candidate of the Liberal Party. But on one important thing, we are in perfect agreement. If the women of Japan had had a voice in our country's affairs, there never would have been a war. <laughs> now, although the militarists and the industrial monopolies of the Zaibatsu are being liquidated, our political parties of the old order are still permitted to exist. <laughs> How to resist their policies? Outvote them. Our voting ratio to the men is 53 to 47. We women hold an American superiority of 3 million dollars. Every woman must go to the vote and vote. Last April, for the first time in history, Japanese women went to the polls to vote. Students, professional women, young mothers with babies strapped to their backs. <laughs> Sweet one, mother has a right to be here. Oh, but uh, I'm afraid. Over here, uh, the woman with a baby, uh, this way. Uh, you are Tuneko Akamatsu, aren't you? The woman, Rita. Oh, please, uh, will you help me I do not know how to vote. Uh, look at a sample ballot. See? The names of all our candidates for the diet. Seventy-five are women. Oh, it does not uh, seem possible. A new day is here. Remember what Mrs. Cato said at the meeting? About women having more power than men because we outnumber them? Uh, but I cannot uh, get used to thinking that way. It is so different from... Everything I was taught as a girl. I know. I was taught the same thing from the Una da Gaku, the treatise on greater learning for women. A woman must look to her husband as her lord and must serve him with all worship and reverence. Hmm. 
Anna, I know my husband does not approve of my being here. But for once, you're doing as you please. It's a fine feeling. Come. Let us go. We are going to vote. We are going to vote. At that election, 38 women were chosen for the Japanese diet. Women of all classes, from typists to university professors. The outside world was amazed. But the emancipation of Japanese women from feudalism was not as sudden as it seemed. The feminist movement had its inception in the blue stocking coterie organized in 1911. It was followed by the new women's association in 1920. And then, finally, the Women's Suffrage Federation. We came out under our true colors and waged a campaign for equal suffrage, just like our sisters of the Western nations. You, Tsuneko, recall the difficulties we had? Oh, one of the greatest was converting other women. They were afraid. We had to break down the traditions of owner Dagaku. For that reason, the sudden opening of the ballot box to Japanese women was a tradition-shattering event. It was a personal triumph for me. I have devoted my life to the feminist movement. I was just a young girl in Nagano. We had organized for a demonstration. Oh, uh, Toneko, are we going through with it? Of course. At noon, we start our march to the city. Uh, it is almost 12 o'clock for now. Yes. We must show the officials that women demand some recognition. They get it in other countries. I wonder what will happen. It is our... Come, everybody, follow me. You are under arrest. You are the leader. Let me go. The police have no right. You come with me. That ought to hold you for a while. What is your name? Tuneko Akamatsu. I've heard of you. A troublemaker. The woman who thinks she's a man. I <laughs> wouldn't be a man if I could. Then why should a young woman like you read this demonstration and get us up in jail? You fool. You can't even understand what this demonstration means to the women of Japan. <laughs> was arrested in ten prefectures. The officials who arrested me called me woman public enemy number one. And during the war, the officials accused me of sabotage against Japan. But uh, Tuneko uh, persevered, and uh, Japan's defeat has been a victory for Tuneko. Uh, today, uh, Tuneko is the leader of thousands of women, and her name is known far beyond the shores of Japan as a champion of the rights of women. The name of Tsuneko Akamatsu has become synonymous with women's rights throughout the East, respected by her sisters, even in the Philippines, where the Filipina is by all odds the most independent woman of the Orient. We Japanese women used to envy the Filipina. She actually engaged in business, not just small shops, but industries, iron mines, sugar centrals, construction, even an inter-island Airlines. Naturally, the Japanese conquest stopped all that. The Japanese army tried to reduce the women of the Philippines to the same status as their women at home. And we Japanese have been called the worst used women in the world. The result was not what the army expected. Women and girls, many professional and business women, flocked to the resistance movement. They put on men's clothes, fought as guerrillas in the Philippine army, or gave their time to the women's auxiliary service. They had something to fight for. Four years before the war began, in the plebiscite of 1937, women's suffrage was permanently established in the Philippines. In India, too, some women can vote. But the right is limited to those who hold property or can meet educational tests. That is Sarojini Naidu leader of the feminist movement in India, a woman who defied the teachings of the past, 
to marry a man of lower caste. India, like Japan, is beginning to see the rise of women toward the position of their sisters in the Western Hemisphere. In a few cases, we have succeeded in electing a woman to the Legislative Assembly, but she must appear veiled in her burqa and rarely speak. Our progress has been slow. India has farther to go than almost any other eastern nation. In the complexity of problems in this land, the value of an Indian woman's life was tied up with age-old traditions, with religion, and with many other factors. Up until a little more than a hundred years ago, if a woman's husband died... Who is that woman stepping up to the funeral pyre? That is the widow. Oh, she's climbing up on the pyre. It is the ancient rite of sati. Certainly sati isn't hmm. still observed. Now that her husband is dead, she can no longer be the mother of his children. Rig Veda has decreed that she make a burning sacrifice of herself. Well, we just can't stand by and permit her to destroy herself. You Americans do not understand. She has served her purpose in this life and is no longer... Good heavens! She's lighting the flame. Yes. This is barbaric. This must be stopped. Control yourself. It is the way. The practice of sati went on. Widows following their husbands in death. Until enlightenment decreed that it must end. With passing time, more and more voices demanded a new place for the Indian woman. And in 1920, when a restless, impatient India rallied around Mahatma Gandhi, in the ranks were many Indian women. We women see in this movement the chance for the freedom which, within ourselves, we have always longed for. Under the leadership of Mrs. Naidu, the women enlisted in the cause. Mrs. Naidu astonished the world by being elected president of the All India Congress. The practice of sati had been abolished. But another ancient custom kept millions of Indian women shackled to the past. Mother, I want to go outside with the others. No, she is not to go. Our daughter is almost a woman now. She must be kept in purda. Purda? You mean I must dress as mother does? Covered all over? With, with only eye holes to see out of? Yes. You must be kept from the sight of the world. You must stay in your home as much as possible. And when you have to go into the streets, you must cover yourself with a veil. But, but why, Father? Again, that persistent question, echoing down through the centuries. The answer had always been the same. But there came a time when that answer was no longer valid. It was 1939. The world was engulfed in war. Every available source of production power was needed. The great majority of Indians, even those who had opposed British policy, wanted to see the Allies win the war. But there were not enough men with necessary skills even in this vast and thickly populated country. For the first time, another reservoir of power was tapped. The women of India flocked into the factories, just as their sisters did in Western lands. We organized an auxiliary corps of more than 5,000 women of every creed and caste. We learned to be switchboard operators, telephone orderlies, wireless operators, plotters in the observers' corps. We drove staff cars, we placed men as clerks in military headquarters. And women medical graduates were recruited into the military medical service to serve abroad as well as on the home front. They were commissioned, and their pay was the same as their brother officers. The bars were down at last. Indian womanhood came out from behind an age-old veil of mystery. Yet thousands of my countrymen still resent the Western idea of feminine equality. Long before Occidental culture was born, woman's place had been assigned to her in India. Only gradually are those who reverence the old ways, accepting the strange new revelation that a woman may aspire to more. Come in, come in, my friend. 
rest a while in my house before you travel on. Thank you. I should like you to meet my wife. I do. Your wife? One does not even speak of his wife in the presence of other men. Oh, I do, sir. I'm proud of her. She's a graduate of the university, you know. The university? Oh, she came out of Perda years ago. Oh, sometimes I long for the old days, when a woman kept to her place, when a man's wife was content to be the keeper of his house, the mother of his children. I am content, sir, to be the keeper of his house, to bring up his children. I think I'm a better mother, a better helpmate for my husband, because my country has given me freedom. Women's struggle for freedom from the tyranny of the past, hard as it was in India and Japan, was dwarfed by its counterpart in China. Chinese women pioneered in the fight for women's rights. This great sprawling country, seat of ancient wisdom and wily masculine ways, became a huge battleground where woman's wit met masculine force and cunning and won. Last March 9th, at a rally of 7,000 women in Chongqing... these women are applauding is Madame Chong Kai-shek, considered by close observers of Chinese affairs, second only to her husband, the Generalissimo, as the most important personage in China. The women of China have won their present high place in the nation largely as a result of two wars. The first was the revolution which ended in 1911. It overthrew the monarchy and brought the dawn of a new China. The first Chinese parliament met in Canton. The people are happy today, celebrating the birth of the Republic. Yes, quite happy. What's this? Ah, a petition signed by a committee from the Chinese Women's Society of the Revolution. What do they want? Uh, let me see. Oh. They say they fought beside the men and helped establish the republic. They want equal suffrage. <laughs> Suffragettes. What foolishness. Why, women don't even vote in the old established democracies, such as the United States and Britain. We can ignore this demand. Before we do that, on it, colleague, pause to consider... Though silk is softer than the sword, it is also stronger. Let us apply that maxim. Tell them their petition is receiving our most careful attention and shelve it. No, I don't think that... Wait, what's that noise? There's a crowd of women outside. The street is full of them. They're marching on the building. Lock the doors. Don't let them in here. That was the beginning of the suffragette movement in China. It failed to win them the right to vote, but it won its leaders a large following. Later, two prominent women leaders in the Kuomintang, Tang Chung Ying and Chang Han Yin, devised a more guarded approach to the citadel of masculine supremacy. They succeeded in getting a bill introduced into Parliament. This bill would make women equal under the law. Perhaps it isn't such a bad measure. Women deserve the protection of the law. No, no. This bill, it is just another trick of the suffragettes. They are like locusts. Give them a nibble, and they will come back and eat your crop. I vote no. No, no, no. In China, the battle dragged on. Force matching guile. 
A law giving women the vote found its way to the statute books, but in many provinces the right was denied. Again, in 1921, the suffragettes tried direct action. A band of 700 stormed the Provisional Assembly in Canton. Scenes of violence were precipitated, and there were a number of casualties. Yes, yes, you are hurt. Uh, let me help you. A cut on the head is not so bad. It is a bit of taste in my mouth. I know. And we failed. Uh, we were not strong enough. We failed because we used the wrong tactics. Yes. I can see that now. Uh, then what should we do? Wait. Do the men need our help? Till we can show what the women of China will do for their country. Uh, that is good advice. Uh, we should take advantage of every opportunity to prove our... Their first opportunity now. came after World War I, when the women joined the student movement in furious protest against that part of the Versailles Treaty which they believed betrayed China's cause. <laughs> Here in Shantung, a great injustice is being perpetrated. It is necessary to act quickly. What is she mouthing about? Women's rights again? Come on, we shall hear what she's saying. We cannot give our consent to this clause of the treaty. It would turn over all the German leased territory in this province to China's potential enemy, Japan. <laughs> we beg all patriotic citizens to join us, men and women together, Demonstrate against this injustice to our country. That woman is right. We cannot permit such an injustice. What you say is true. This time the women have chosen the right path. Largely as a result of these demonstrations, the loss of territory was averted. Meanwhile, the women of China strengthened their cause. Their scene of action varied. In Hankow, where corruption had made justice a joke, the women's union actually took over the courts. Next case. Uh, I want divorce. Uh, my husband uh, works me like his ox. I work too. I need her help on the farm. When you plow your field, who holds the plow? Why, I do, of course. I'm the man. And who draws it? Why, the ox? And, and I. I am Hannah, a right beside Ox. Before you separate, go home and try this. Tomorrow, you yoke your wife to the Ox. Good. The next day, she drives you with the Ox. What? A man driven by his wife? The neighbors would laugh me off my farm. That is the court's decision. Either that or you lose your wife. Uh, as you will. I'll have to try it. I can't afford to get behind with my plowing. <laughs> But it was not until the Great War engulfed the East that Chinese women had the opportunity to demonstrate their right to equal participation with men in the affairs of their country. They were not fighting now for women's rights, but for the preservation of China. Madame Chiang Kai-shek gathered the leaders of all classes and parties into one group, the Women's Advisory Council. And on the fighting front... We'll have to silence those mortars. But how can we? We have no artillery. We'll have to take them without artillery. Come on. Ow! We can't go any farther. They've got us pinned down. Machine guns, too. They'll wipe us out. We're on the reverse of the slope. If we only had enough men to send a party around that hill and take them on the flank. We haven't. Listen. What's that? An attack on the Japanese position. Look, coming there on our flank. Another band of our gorillas. May the heavenly ones be thanked. They've taken the hill. Come, let us join them. Here comes their leader to meet us. I'll greet him. Comrades, we wish to thank you. You saved our lives. You are very welcome. Uh, someday, you and your men may do as much for us. Why? You are a woman. <laughs> so? Uh, surely I am not the first woman you ever saw. No, but a woman captain of a guerrilla band. Look, uh, she is not the only one. See, they're all women. Uh, yes, comrade. We are all women. The women of New China. My grandmother used to say, one woman is worth two men. Uh, because a woman is the mother of the rice. But if she could see this... Could your grandmother have done what we did today? She... 
Why, she couldn't even walk. Her feet had been bound when she was a little girl to make her dainty. Uh, the women of Sanna have come a long way since the time of your grandmother, comrade. A long, hard, uphill journey. Uh, but uh, luckily for us, our feet are not bound. We can march on, side by side with you, on equal footing at last. We are with you. Every mile of your journey. We can never forget what the women did for our country in this war. You shall have full rights with us in peace. Under the leadership of Madame Chiang Kai-shek, this prophecy was fulfilled. The Chinese woman of today has exchanged her security and seclusion for insecurity and freedom. And the adaptability which in olden times was required of her as a wife is enabling her to fit into her new role with equal efficiency and grace. Woman has done her part. But, dear, after eight years of devastating war, a storm cloud hovers over China. Apparently, the two factions which successfully fought Japan have been unable to get together on a basis of national unity. Yet, during the war, both factions were united in Women's Advisory Council. We worked together then, even when there was no such common meeting ground between the men. Yes, men are stubborn. It may be that only the women can perform this great task, the bringing of domestic peace and unity to China. There is a still greater task, the greatest task of all. Perhaps it will be the women who eventually will bring peace and unity to the entire Orient, and may I say, the world. In Japan, uh, the women will never tolerate a return to militarism. The women of India do not wish ever to see their sons and brothers die in another war. Nor do the women of the Philippines who fought and died beside their sons and brothers. Nor the women of China, who today are toiling to restore the devastation caused by misguided men. The dikes of masculine supremacy have been breached throughout the Orient. More recently, sudden events have swept women into power in a national crisis. The new voice in the East, a voice that speaks in subtle but penetrating tones, will be heard throughout the world. Listening to the Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coins to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. May I repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coins. The University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story was written by Arnold Marquis and directed by Max Huddle. Original music was under the direction of Henry Russell. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.